All right, welcome to Deprogram Podcast, and it is officially October, everybody. And you know what that means. That means Halloween, and that means the darker topics. But before I bring my guest in and we talk about his new book, which I can't pronounce, I'm going to let him do that work. But before I do that, I have the announcement to make that October will probably be the last month that this is called Deprogram because me and my partner. Cal Korf are going to be doing a podcast together. And so it's going to take on, you know, a different name, a different thing that represents what we're doing. And it's still, you know, from politics to the paranormal. And you know, Cal, there's going to be lots of UFOs and lots of different things like that covered. Uh, I'm giving you guys a little bit of time to come in. Is this streaming across YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, DLive, Twitch? So come on in. Be sure to share this on your social media platforms, wherever you are. Make sure to follow, like, subscribe, especially on that YouTube channel so you can tune in because all of this month we're having some great dark Halloween topics like today it's about werewolves. We're going to have C. Stockton in about Appalachian vampires. I've got Anne Celine coming on. She's talking about vampire cults, vampire culture. I've also got Anthony Tyler coming on. He's talking about demons. And of course, I've got Matthew Lee Embleton here today. And we're talking about werewolves in French literature. So let's not keep Matthew out of this conversation any longer. I'm going to bring him in. Welcome, Hello. Matthew. Thank you. All right. So before we get into werewolves, tell everybody about your new book that you have coming out. I'll let you just take it away. You can show them and tell them where to get it. Okay. So uh, here's the book. And uh, it's called uh, Bisclavre. It's originally by Marie de France or Marie de France in modern French pronunciation. It's a medieval werewolf tale in Old French or Anglo-Norman French. And I've done a, a translation. So there it is. That's amazing. So what was it about um, werewolves that made you want to write about them? Um, I think for me, my, my, my entry into it was the, the idea of well, the, the language aspect. I, I was very, I mean, I love languages. I'm interested in, in Latin and also the way that Latin evolved into the modern Romance languages like French, Spanish, Italian, Portuguese and so on. And, um, and I was looking for sort of old medieval texts um, in old French and I came across this one and um, the, the subject of uh, werewolves for me made it even more interesting. It was interesting to see uh, how werewolves are treated in literature. And, uh, and this is, um, yeah, it's very interesting because it's like a sort of a moral tale, a, a courtly romance. Um, mm -hmm. uh, yes, yeah, very interesting. The, the language is, is beautiful and it's fascinating. So that, that sort of got me into it. And since then, I've been uh, looking a lot more into sort of werewolf uh, folklore and myths and mythology and so on. Right. So there's nothing like there's nothing like a lot of people. It's like like for me, it probably would have been from my childhood and folklore, mm -hmm. not even folklore. A lot of us get into it from something modern, mm -hmm. you know, yes. like something from pop culture. And then we weave into this, you know, a deeper sort of rabbit hole, so to speak. Yes, that's right. Yeah. I mean, uh, the, the, since this has uh, been there's so many films about werewolves as well, uh, all of them um, sort of treated the, the stories like, in different ways. Um, yeah, I remember seeing American Werewolf in London. That was uh, that mm. was terrifyingly visceral and fascinating, but also darkly comical as well. Um, obviously, Wolf with Jack Nicholson and Michelle Pfeiffer. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so it's, there are some really, really good films that sort of turn you on to the subject. It's, it's fascinating. Yeah, and it's, um, it's also like we're focusing probably mostly on French literature in that time. But, mm -hmm. I mean... Mm. It, wolves and the beasts go back as long as mankind does yes exactly um so the idea of, of a werewolf or a lycanthrope um it it fits into a wider culture of uh shape-shifting the, the ability to transform into an animal uh any animal um and this i mean they believe that uh, there is sort of a, a shamanic tradition of calling upon a, a spirit animal um, to either sort of um, to to access or to gain attributes um, that are associated with that animal, um, and there's a cave in uh, South France. Uh, it's called um, it's La Grotte des Trois Frères, the, the Cave of Three Brothers, 
and it was discovered and rediscovered in 1914. And there were lots of cave paintings there. Normally, cave paintings have um, uh, purely animals, no, no human beings at all. And uh, in this case, though, however, they, they found a, a painting, a cave painting of a kind of a human form that had sort of other animal attributes like antlers and hooves and so on. So um, it's been interpreted as at the beginnings of uh, a representation of a, of a sort of a, a shamanism or totemism of uh, being able to sort of transform in, into an animal at will um, uh, to, to sort of uh, to access um, aspects of that animal. Uh, and also, um, <clears throat> so with, with cave paintings, um, the, the, the animals that were painted uh, could either be a record of um, how many animals they caught while hunting that day, or it could right. be a kind of a, a visualization of, of the animals that they wanted to catch the next day or when they next went hunting. Um, and I think out of that, it sort of connected with this um, shamanism, the idea that if you want to catch that particular animal, then you would want to take on the characteristics of that animal to see how it behaves, to see how it moves. So yeah, to catch the animal, you must become the animal. And I think that that connected with the sort of this shamanism and that idea of the, of the spirit animal so, and transforming into the animal that you want to catch. So that that was, that was how it was sort of later interpreted. Well, that's interesting. That's almost, I mean, that's almost like possession. Yes. But in exactly. some strange way. Yes, that's right. Yeah. It's, so it's, it's, you would want to become the animal because you want its whatever power you think it has? Yes, exactly. Yeah, that's one aspect of it. Um, and, uh, and, and later on, of course, there's the idea that uh, wearing a, a wolf's skin would would uh, would give you the, the abilities or the, the, the ferocity, perhaps, of the wolf in battle. Uh, and that's something that comes up later uh, in, in Germanic culture. Um, some of the Germanic tribes that were coming up against the edges of the Roman Empire, they had a lot of decorated shields and armour and weapons decorated with wolves, the idea of wolf warriors. Um, and also later on in Norse mythology, there are also the Ulvhernar, which is uh, it, it's, it's roughly translates as one who wears the skin of a wolf or a wolf coat, perhaps. So the, the, the okay. berserkers, obviously the name berserker comes from uh, a bear shirt. So somebody who wears a bear skin or a, a bear shirt. And these versions, the Ulfhednar, they were the versions who, who wore the wolf skins to, to have the ferocity of a wolf in battle. And they, they got themselves into a frenzy. They, they almost um, uh, allowed themselves to be sort of taken over by the, this spirit of this sort of ferocious wolf so that it'd be absolutely fearless and ferocious in battle. <clears throat> well, that that's a really interesting thing to to link this ferocious wolf to a human thing. Like, I mean, I'm sure wolves have their their <clears throat> fights and their battles too within the pack, but ours our battles are. I I think they would. I think they would be a lot different. Very, <laughs> you much, know, so. Very much so. Yes, <laughs> than a wolf battle. <laughs> like they're in their clan trying to make sure they're an alpha male and keep everybody in line. And we're basically usually our wars are about domination and oh, and you yes. know and religion acquiring and, land and you know yes. pillaging well, and the, the acquiring land thing is interesting because obviously um, wolves they they've got a very strict uh, structure a hierarchy as you say the alpha male uh, the the enforcer or the pacifier and often they would sort of um, they would fight perhaps over territory, or if, if one of the wolves sort of stepped above its rank, it would be sort of punished by the enforcer. That they'd have their own sort of code that they have within them, which which is which is fascinating. I saw a documentary about it. There was a guy who lived sort of with wolves and observed their behaviour, and he sort of lived mm -hmm. among them when they were sort of um, sort of young, very very young, and they they sort of they grew to to know him as a, as a member of the pack, and he saw his position within that pack change as as he studied them. Interesting. So he he becomes part of the pack. Yeah, they, they accepted him as the pack, as as the sort of the leader, the alpha. Uh, and then he went away for a long time, uh, and he rejoined them. He put the same clothes back on, so they'd recognise his scent. Mm -hmm. And then uh, and then th th they knew it was him, but there was still this. Uh, he couldn't get back to the alpha. He was sort of the, the secondary. Right. So he they, was they, demoted. They, yeah, he was exactly. He was demoted. And um, but they found a new alpha. And, and he was sort of shown his place, his new place within the pack. He wasn't the alpha anymore, but they still accepted him because he had brought them up. He'd raised them. He'd fed them. Um, yeah, so they still accepted right. 
Right, because it, it's it is like um, we've got John aside saying here. Uh, I'll highlight it for us that I mean they're really it's just, actually wolf packs are family unions with moms and dads as leaders, right? Exactly. The, the alpha male is the father. Yep, the, 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 the strict uh, social structure which has been observed and documented. Yeah, absolutely. Right, so it, it's interesting that it's 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 almost like we don't necessarily when you're, we're doing war, it's just because. Well, obviously, mm. obviously, historically, we could fall prey to predator creatures, mm-hmm. so that's frightening. So to use that invokes those ancient fears. Yes, yes, interesting, yes. So obviously, um, in, in history, the wolf was would have been one of the most feared predators. So to be able to, to defend yourself from that wolf, from those wolves, um, you would have to learn something about, about how they hunt, when when they decided to attack um if they if they sort of waited sort of lay in wait waiting for a lone person while they were sort of uh, uh putting their livestock out to pasture then they would they would choose one person and attack you, you sort of observe their habits to protect yourself against them <clears throat> interesting so now i mean this is all ancient stuff that's sticking yeah. with us what is the take on it by the time we get up to Let's say we go to France and uh-huh. we can start at the 1500s maybe because that's when some – you start to see histor- – I mean, well, we can start at medieval times actually when you're writing the book. 1500s is still, but you can start before that because we start seeing some mythologies getting written about wolves that are outside of war. Yes, that's right. So um... – yeah, the idea of the wolf in in French and other sort of European uh, medieval literature, um, you, you, they're, they're part of, they're, they're kind of a metaphor, an allegory for aspects of, of the beast within. Uh, as somebody has a, a dark secret, and that, that could perhaps be that they are a werewolf. So they are sort of, they're, they're, they're shunned from society perhaps. or So the, the idea that, that you must keep the, your inner beast locked in Otherwise, mm-hmm. uh, something terrible will happen to you. They, so they're, they're kind of used metaphorically as for moral tales. Um, so it was it was more about that. It was it's yeah the sort of the moral tales, which were a very important part of, of that literature at that time. <clears throat> right. So it, it's basically addressing maybe there was a social problem that they needed to address. Uh, yeah, possibly, and also the influence of religion as well, because it wasn't really until um, and the dominance of Christianity in in Europe. Um, where the idea of something to do with a, th- this mythology of the werewolf was was linked to that of the devil. It was then it then became satanic, so that had other implications with it as well. So the, the idea that it was attached to Christian morality and that the werewolf, the beast within, represented the devil, so that that link was then made with with these sort of moral tales, and it grew out of that. That's that's interesting. So John Side says he has a question. I haven't seen it yet. Hopefully he'll ask it, but yeah. we're going to have apparently a good question from John Side. He loves the the werewolf. So uh, there's this whole like moral tales or warning of our inner beast, and mm-hmm. somehow we've connected that one to the the wolf. But it, it's it's different. It's not the wolf. It's not this. It's a man wolf. Right? Yes. Like it's it's yes. it's a it's it's a, it's a like we said a possession. So it's this. It's not the wolf. It's not the man. It's like this supernatural being. Yes. It's different. Yes. It's not There's natural. This, exactly. So in mythology, um, someone is perhaps uh, turned into a werewolf by a, a curse or an affliction, or by coming into contact by being bitten or scratched by another werewolf. There there are different stories that um, that show how that happens. So, I mean, the, the, the gods, for example, punishing somebody would then turn them into a wolf. So, uh, or right. a, 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 a werewolf, anyway, a lycanthrope, a lycanthropos. So, so when you say the gods, do you mean like Roman gods or more pagan times yes. that was? Because that would yeah, have been yeah. medieval times. Uh, yeah, that. so the, the mythology of that would have still been known about. Um, it would have been, I think, suppressed to degree by Christianity in, in some parts. But that, that classical learning... The, the literature and mythology of, of classical antiquity would have uh, resurfaced slightly after the medieval period in, in the Renaissance of sort of humanism and the study of classical antiquity, where all of that mythology 
would have would have been rediscovered and translated from Greek into other languages or Latin or so on. So uh, yeah, so then you, then you get the, the aspect of um, that the gods uh, sort of punishing people by turning them into a werewolf, or um, yeah, so did different things happen, an affliction or a curse because somebody has angered one of the gods by doing something by displaying hubris or arrogance before the gods, they'd be punished in that way. Right. It's like putting you in your humble place. Okay, well, if you're not going to behave, we'll make you an animal. Uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So there's a story in um, uh, Hesiod wrote a, a story in his Fragmenta Astronomica about um, a king who was a king of Arcadia called uh, Lucaon, which is like the word Lucos, meaning wolf. And he was no, this king was known for his cruelty, terrible things he'd done. Uh, Zeus went to visit him. And uh, Lucaon decides to test his omniscience. Are you really a god? Are you really all seeing, all knowing? Uh, so he he serves up a feast, and in that feast is human flesh, and including that of his own son, who he had killed, uh, to see if Zeus would recognise this. And of course, he did immediately, and he was furious because obviously cannibalism is a is a big no no. And he punished him by turning him into a werewolf, uh, killing off all of his offspring except for the son. That Lucaon had killed, he brought him back to life. Interesting. That I mean, and that's what what's the that's the worst punishment you can get is destroying your offspring and making sure you don't yeah. carry your yeah, genetics exactly. on. That's yeah. what, I mean, yeah. uh, we're we're so distant from that concept, but I mean, it could it's even a punishment for us today. We just don't realize in that way, like if. If you can't reproduce and you really want children, that's that's a painful mm -hmm. situation. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. 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 <clears throat> so, like, I mean, we've got a, a few people here who are big werewolf lovers. So I'm telling mm -hmm. them to ask their questions. They said they don't want to ask. And I'm like, ask away because uh, you guys are going to be able to think of things that I won't be able to think of. Um, so really, yeah. Yes. So what what is a good example let's say like in medieval medieval times we've got this i mean rome is something totally different mm -hmm. that, you know romulus and that's i think that's sort of the the roots of rome is in the story of romulus yeah, and this sort of wolf. Wolf. yeah the two brothers romulus and remus raised by a she-wolf yeah. exactly yes yes yeah. yes so it's interesting that rome has that connection to the wolf yes, yes i, I they... find that really fascinating yeah, it's fascinating because it had already been well established in, in Greek mythology, but they they adapted the Greek word lukanthropos, uh, for, meaning werewolf. So they, they didn't necessarily, uh, lupinotum, I think, is the closest Latin word that's equivalent to lukanthropos. So they, they've, they adopted a lot of Greek mythology and they saw some of it as similar to their own and also Etruscan mythology, which they had also incorporated. As they expanded, they took in all these different cultures and, and sort of melded them together. So how is that sort of pagan idea, how does it change in medieval time? What's happening in medieval times that mm. changes? Like you've got that founding, you've got a punishment, but now you have this thing as this idea of a curse. Like it, it, does it change when we go from pagan to Christianity, this whole concept? I believe it does because I think um, the, so the idea of the curse as, as punishment um, wouldn't be compatible with uh, Christian morality, so therefore it, that was sort of kept out of the of the stories about werewolves, um, which were then given a, a sense of a Christian morality about it. So that there was uh, it was you know the more the moral tale of, of avoid of suppressing your inner beast and doing the right thing, rather than if you do this then God will turn you into a, an animal or something else or whatever. So that the, the morality that is emphasised is, is very different. So Christian morality, very different from pagan, uh, and also the morality in mythological tales, that they, they wouldn't have been compatible. So that that would have been replaced by Christian morality, right? right. Where the, and I mean, pagans wouldn't have had that heaven and hell, or like it, they, it they have, may have had like, various. Were they more accepting of the idea of transforming into an animal? Like, was less? I don't know. I think um, for maybe for some people, there would have been an understanding that these. Uh, transformations into other animals, um, these sort of supernatural events, um, were to varying degrees seen as metaphorical or allegorical. 
um, right. not, not necessarily liter literal because of the and distinction. Christians are literal. But I think I think so. I think it, I think it's more mm -hmm. sort of clear cut. So we have, um, speaking of getting Christian, I'm going to show this question. I don't know if it might be a little premature to the stage rep, but Anastasia <laughs> yeah. wanted to know if Jesus was a shapeshifter. I have heard this. You, I know this This sounds it sounds crazy, doesn't it? But um, uh, there is, uh, let's see, it's around, I think, the 8th or 9th century. Um, there's a text written in Coptic, which is like a kind of an old Egyptian language by uh, St. Cyril of Jerusalem. And uh, the idea is that uh, Judas identifies Jesus by kissing him uh, because that's the only way to identify him because otherwise he's able to change his appearance. So, and that's why Judas kissed him. So that was the only effective way of pointing him out to, to the people who were sent to arrest him. Oh, so, I see. I yeah. see you without saying it. Interesting. Yeah, and so Coptic Christians, um, some of their uh, sort of doctrines and texts would have fallen outside of, of that which it would have been chosen to have included in the Bible. Uh, and that's why some, some of those sort of stories and manuscripts were sort of kept out of the Bible, and, but still sort of found in archives later as, as they resurfaced in the 20th century, which obviously the occultists of the time would have found fascinating. So that these sort of long buried texts with different tales right. and what they implied about different things and moralities and religions. Right. So, and, and, and I'm going to go back like to the medieval times where they're taking it literal. Mm -hmm. So that's entirely different because you actually will start to believe in, I guess what I would see as nonsensical that you, you, you there really is a werewolf or a mm -hmm. man, not just a dog or a wolf, but there really is a demon out in the woods after you. Yeah. So, um, describing events like after they happened post rationalizing maybe perhaps uh, temporary insanity or a terrible event a murder or something uh, people perhaps would have been accused of of uh, being influenced by the devil um mm -hmm. the the devil told me to do it or you know i've been i've been practicing witchcraft or you know or and it, all these diff different elements so it was all sort of seen as one and the same thing that was that was accessed via the right. devil the devil's influence so it, it's the like the devil influence. rather than the beast within it's the devil working through us right so it's not a, a question of your human nature it's a question of some external evil force um yeah i think so yeah mm -hmm. that's yeah. influencing your um f f human nature so <sighs> Uh, oh, no, that's the wrong one. We have Jonasite saying, thoughts on dogman phenomena of the USA Midwest. Um, well, I, that's, that, that's, a, we're, we're going to be talking about the French. That is a little outside of where we are chronologically right now. We're going to, we'll get to that because we'll talk about modern times and modern dog mm -hmm. sightings and werewolves and stuff like that. But I wanted to go back into this idea of being cursed mm -hmm. and being like, like a witch cursing you. Yes. Um, do you have any good tales? Like what, what kind of tales does your book cover? Like, does it cover curses and witches, like the stories from France? This, I mean, this particular tale that I've translated, um, it doesn't involve, it doesn't go into detail, uh, why this, this man or this, this baron, um, has been afflicted with that. It, it doesn't deal with that. It goes, it goes straight to the idea that we know that he is, we accept that he is, and then it's, it's what, it, what goes on from that. So it, it's it's a relatively, I mean, it's 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 a booklet. It's a relatively short poem. I think it's about, about five hundred lines. Uh, so I think it, uh, the the uh, the story starts when we're told that he is, but we're told um, the the difference in in words. Like uh, of Bisclavre is, I think it's in Breton uh, dialect of French. That's their word for a werewolf. But um, in uh, Anglo-Norman, they call it Garulf. Uh, so the modern French word loup garou is like a, 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 a combination of those two terms put together. So loup is from Latin lupus, and then uh, garou is from garulf, the sort of Anglo-Norman French version. So there are two, two words meaning the same thing in different dialects put together. For, so for loup garou. Interesting. Now, what is really 
like when I when I think of 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 wolves, I think of like Lon Chaney and all the modern stuff. And I've mentioned this before. I, we've got some new people coming, and so I'm reiterating. And we today look at it in that Christian view. I don't. We don't. We don't see it in that pagan view. I, I, generally, we see it. We we we've been influenced by that. I think right from the medieval times up. I, I don't think we could escape that. So we were talking before we came on here about. Um, Gilles Garnier and I had informed you about it but he was a guy in the 1500s in France and he was known as the werewolf of Dole and he was responsible for the murder of many children's dismemberment and cannibalism and he then he was caught red-handed like he was caught um he he evaded capture for a while but they caught him and he used the werewolf he used the whole werewolf thing uh, as almost like a, a, an excuse of why he did it and yeah. we would know him today as basically a child murderer or serial killer yeah we would have a different phrase for it because of science but yet we're still influenced by i think that kind of idea that he's been possessed by he, you know, a demon gave him a salve and whatever. But he he did the exact same thing that you're talking about. Yes, and also it um, it almost a, a allows somebody or the, to believe that they can kind of externalize the bad thing that they've done because it's from an outside influence. So yeah, as I say earlier, the, like the devil told me to do it, or um, um, it, you were possessed by something, a, 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 an evil spirit or a demon or something that made you do it. it, it it's almost as if um someone might in their last hopes sort of to try and say externalize it so, oh it wasn't me it was it was the, the devil the devil made me do it, it it's mm -hmm. kind of external it's taken away from something that's within the capability of any of us yes and so what what were the <laughs> chances like if if i said i'm in medieval times and i'm a crazy insane person who's mm -hmm. hearing voices telling me to kill children and i tell everybody that it's the werewolf thing what are what are their chances of getting off of that crime um i would say pretty slim i would yeah. um, you're, you're, so <laughs> the the i guess the idea would be you're hearing voices uh, you you're, you're possessed by the devil you must uh, sort of um dismiss and deny the devil and you must pray and you must be cleansed and you must swear this oath and do this and do that it was the very sort of a religious aspect to it right hmm. but like 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 i th at first i thought maybe okay maybe if he says he's a werewolf that will get him off but i thought you know what um i don't think it would yeah. because <clears throat> exactly. i mean especially if you're caught dismembering children uh, and and stuff like that. I don't mm. think it would get you off of anything. I think it would. Um, no, no. I think you're kind of doomed to face your fate. Exactly. And on the other side of that, of course, you've got this the story of P uh, Peter Stumpf, the the werewolf of Bedburg. Um. So he was accused of having done those things. Um. He was, for example, he was sort of tortured to confess that he'd been practicing witchcraft since he was twelve years old. Uh, and that uh, uh, torture to confess that he'd uh, killed the, um, uh, pregnant women, 14 children, and, and eaten them or half eaten them to, to confess to all of these things, and that the devil had given him a magic belt that allowed him to transform himself into a werewolf. The belt was never found, of course, um, but it was enough to, for, him to, for him to have confessed it. That confession was testimony. It was evidence against him, and um, it, it just, it, it, it's oh, it's he was brutally executed in the worst possible ways. It was awful, so so brutal. But then, mm -hmm. uh, th then the, the deterrent of that, the, the, ter the deterrent of the brutality of how he was executed, was, it was supposed to serve as a deterrent. But what if he hadn't done that? What if it, he'd just been persecuted because he'd fallen out with someone? Or, uh, for example, he, right. had a, he had a mistress called Catherine who was also married. Um, and then when the husband found out, uh, there may have been rumours spread. Uh, about these things and people believe those rumors that the gossip and it would have accelerated into different accusations being made and it would, would have reached the point where that would have been formalized and they would have been so John, yeah yeah john aside's just saying that he had asked a question and sometimes guys when you ask a question youtube doesn't show them up like i'm streaming at five different places so if i miss it i, I apologize but he was saying that werewolves was a common term for serial killers 
that makes sense. So serial killers just didn't show up with Jack the Ripper. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, good point. Um, and we've got. He also says that we've got belt was used by hex and wolves and other type of wolves, but we also have Anastasia talking about um women as wolves. Yes, not just witches. Point. So the, it wasn't just men that were accused; women were accused as well. Now, I I would be interested to know what people what the criteria for a woman werewolf was. Does that I, because I'm I have a feeling it might be a little different than men because this whole wolf idea is, feels very masculine. It feels it's very tri attributed to men. You would think that right off the the bat. Yeah, and that you'd think that uh, that, that being a witch would be more um, attributed to to women. And that's, and it's, it, you maybe get more, obviously, a lot more. You only got a, f a few male witches, or they were also called seers or warlocks. And then the, the women, as well as witches, they'd be called seeresses. Um, so, and also, there's, it's the same with, with werewolves as well. In fact, the term werewolf itself comes from Old English. Uh, the wer or ver section means man, and obviously, wolf means wolf. So, it literally mm -hmm. translates as man wolf. So to say to say um, a female werewolf a fe would be a female man wolf. It's kind of a contradiction in terms, and or right. a, a were woman, but that would translate as man woman. So the old English word yeah. for woman is quen. So that it'd be a quen wolf. Is that's what a it would be called wolf. a quen wolf? If if the the mythology had existed enough for it to be translated into Anglo-Saxon, that's what it would have been called. So by its terminology, it does seem to imply the masculine, but the, that certainly didn't stop stories being made. Uh, there was one, the, the, the 300 She-Wolves of Julich in 1591. Um, the story promises that these 300 sort of uh, She-Wolf women, but uh, it turns out to be the, the testimony of one woman. And again, this, this magic belt that one of our viewers, I think, mentioned, uh, that crops up in, in a few of these tales, the idea of a magic belt. Yep. So it's interesting John that they mentioned mention that. Exactly, yeah. So belt, that, that, yeah. That's it. Yeah, so that crops up quite a lot. The idea of um, either, in that case, a belt, or in Norse mythology, the idea of putting on an animal skin, the skin of a wolf as well. Mm -hmm. this, um, this other thing, this, this sort of magical item that is, is part of it, that has a sort of a talismanic sort of purpose and function. Now... We, John, amazing. <laughs> He's also talking about the Irish werewolf said to be protectors or Celtic. So yes. again, we're, this is pre his uh, Matthew's book starts during medieval times and French, but w there is like a, a lot of people have a lot of this history, especially if you're Celtic yeah. or you're pegging today, where they yeah. say no, like the, you can see the difference. The werewolf mm. is a protector. You yeah. go into the Christian church, and now it's a, a demon. Yeah, that's that's very interesting. The fact that they're protectors, that's that's amazing. And also in other parts of the world where you wouldn't necessarily get wolves, that mythology would be replaced by whatever the most feared predator was in that area, uh, whether it was some some sort of wild a wild cat or a, 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 a reindeer that had a sort of a beast like quality about it. Um, different parts of the world, or a bear even, they have this, those same qualities that would have the same mythologies attached to them. But uh, the idea of uh, a werewolf as a protector, that's a very interesting difference. Well, and, I mean, if you think about it, dogs can be our protectors. Oh, absolutely, yes. Man's best friend. I mean, we use them, yeah, man's best friend. And yeah. wolf, I mean, there's. I know somebody who had a dog who's half a quarter wolf or whatever it is. And, wow. and it was a great dog, you know, like great yeah. dog. And so dogs are our protectors. But yes. Because they're so, it, their senses are so highly tuned. They can hear things that we can't hear. They can sense things that we can't necessarily sense unless we really listen to our inner voices. They are so highly tuned to those things. They're so hyper aware. Um, and that, that's incredible. And I think there's something about us as humans that really admires that quality in, in wolves and dogs. The way that their hearing is so much better than ours. Their sense of smell is so much better than ours. Like, for example, in the film uh, Wolf, Jack Nicholson, where suddenly he gets this, mm. his senses increase and he can hear everyone in the whole office block talking and he can just, he can tune his ears to speak. That heightening of the senses must be an incredible kind of allure to, to this idea of, of becoming, giving yourself up to this beast or becoming this beast, but then eventually you become consumed by the beast. So it's a kind of a temporary power that then you lose because you're, you're, you're consumed by the beast. That's right. And mm. 
so it's 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 kind of like I mean the were the werewolf is kind of like a vampire where it can I mean it's changing its yes what it means depending on the context or the, the yes. society or whatever. So we've talked about the werewolf, you know, and as a curse being bitten, um, as protective. <laughs> Where does the full moon come into this? Does the full moon show up in medieval yeah. times? Because we haven't mentioned that trans. Because mm -hmm. there's this idea that you get bit, and then there's a transformation according to the cycles of the moon. Yes, this is yeah, brilliant. So in Latin, uh, the word for moon is luna. Uh, there was also a goddess of the moon, also called Luna or Selene in Greek mythology, and uh, so obviously the word lunacy or lunatic comes from that same word for the moon. So the idea that was very popular in medieval times was that um, the, the moon affected um, the human body, particularly the brain, as it was the most moist of organs. And as it affected the tides, it affected the water within us. And it sort of it temporarily interrupted or, or disrupted the alignment of water molecules in our nervous system and in our brains and caused temporary insanity. So that's the link between the, the full moon and becoming the beast or temporarily insane that that yeah that's the link and, and does that show up in literature and media like when does that show up in medieval times or is that later or um i i think it's it's definitely there because it's been it's been built upon um every every different story has had elements taken from it and then added to other stories like the magic belt and again like the, the full moon so i mean some uh, stories about werewolves um, it just says, for, for example, in, in Bisclavery, that uh, he just disappears during the week, and at the weekends he's, he's a sort of a uh, is a werewolf. So it doesn't say anything about the full moon necessarily. It just it, it doesn't specify when he disappears off into the forest. So it's that the connection with the moon isn't made in that particular story, but it is made in other stories. So every time these stories um, that there are different ingredients of the story. And different stories have right. different amounts of these ingredients, or sometimes not at all, or they've left out the part about the moon, but they've included something else like the magic belt. So there's all these yeah, different right. ingredients. And every time we get new sort of stories that are being reinvented, they're reinvented to, to sort of touch base with the fears that are prevalent within us at whatever time that is. And obviously that, you know, horror fiction, right. fiction everything is constantly reinvented. So I, I and I'm assuming that they have they're going to add whatever elements they feel they need to explain something that's happening. Yes. As their form of logic. Yes, exactly. So for example, in Bisclavre, there are no in fact it, it doesn't say that he preys upon people. The it, the most it implies is that he survives by theft. That he he just steals things. There are no there's no mention of any sort of grisly killings or dismemberments or anything like that it, it mm -hmm. just sort of it lives by stealing and hiding in, in the woods uh, it says that you know he, he does great harm but it doesn't specify what that harm is it doesn't really go into detail it's not so until it's you... sort of sorry i was just gonna say it's sort of like a dog or a bear stealing our stuff yeah oh, yeah, it's, it's, yeah yeah it's, it's it's more like that but uh, but then when you have this um this uh a climate of uh religious confrontation where and suddenly you have the people who have a different doctrine to you, you then say that they are devil worshippers or they are connected with evil. It suddenly becomes a lot more necessary to go into a lot more detail about the grisly and bloodthirsty nature of their crimes to, to incite a sense of outrage and, and moral retribution that that, that person is, is deserving. So and that's when, so late, as there was a lot more interest. Uh, the printing press was developed, so pamphlets of detailing all these stories could be much more widely disseminated, and it, it became necessary to give more detail about these different people who had had their hands, you know, bitten off or they'd been decapitated, and and sometimes really grisly detail, um, and and obviously parts of bodies that were left and all that sort of stuff. It, there was a lot more detail about that later on. So. We got a really good question here from Anastasia. Speaking of stories, Little Red Riding Hood. Ah, Hello? yes. That, what exactly. about that? Where did that show up? Good question. That's, exactly. Yeah, brilliant. So that's um, uh, that sort of came much later. So it was a, it was a, in fact, it was a kind of a return to the the idea of the moral tale or a cautionary tale. 
so the the idea of the idea of the beast uh and also the also the idea that um a warning to to young women not to go walking in the woods late at night because there may be beasts about but also because of her ultimate victory at the end of the story a warning to men not to prey upon young women in the forest because look they might get their heads chopped off or you know they they might also be in trouble as well so it's it's a warning to everyone do the right thing don't prey on people be good and so to get that message into children very early on through, with this metaphor of the beast as being right. the evil that you keep down because even though these children's stories that we might think are horrible or evil they had a a, a purpose to warn people from a grim you know reality yeah the, the story of the boy who cried wolf for example uh, so don't don't yeah don't pretend there's danger if there isn't because when on that one day when there really is a wolf and you cry wolf and people don't believe you then you you will be eaten by the wolf and it'll be your fault because you cried wolf too many times and you weren't believed so yeah that's another one of those sort of short stories that again a moral tale or a cautionary tale a warning to people That was a great question because I mean, the, I, what was that? Was it, is it the Company of Wolves? No, there was this movie about wolves and it's really creepy and I forgot what it was called. Maybe it was in the Company of Wolves. Mm -hmm. It's it's a cre it's a creepy movie. And then you've got like there's there's so many mo there's movies they go back into like trying to be historical. Now we've got the beast of what was that called the beast of beast of Jevodan. Jevodan, thank you yes. my french is not good is it <laughs> the <laughs> beast of Jevodan. i was yeah the beast of Jevodan. now that comes later because gilles jarnier which i was talking about before he was in the 1500s the beast mm. of Jevodan's like the 1765 yes and what does can you can we kind of refer to that because it's a famous story Yes, very famous story. Um, so the, the the panic and um, uh, the, the the news of it spreading widely happened around 1765, but the first killings began in around late 1764. Uh, at that time, uh, in that part of France, it was very, very rural, lots of uh, very, very small villages, very far away from each other, uh, living sort of uh, subsistence farming, that kind of thing. And, and wolf attacks were commonplace. It, I mean, it was estimated that there were about 100 uh, wolf attacks a year at that time. So mm -hmm. there wasn't the initial panic because they thought it was, okay, this, this happens every few years or so, there's some wolf attacks. But then they kept happening, and then they started increasing in number. And there, there were some people that just saw this, this beast. They weren't, in fact, some people weren't even sure if it was one beast or several uh, people who had uh, survived encounters uh, couldn't necessarily agree on what the beast actually looked like. Some people said it looked a bit like a lion. Some people said it had the head of a greyhound or a very long tail. All these sort of different descriptions, which maybe partially contradicted each other, but they all had a slightly different take on this this beast. It could have been it could have been several beasts. Uh, uh, also, it had a sort of a, a brown or russet coloured fur with a black stripe down its back. All these sorts of different descriptions, and uh, the the press um, got hold of it. And uh, it was it was widespread, even even in uh, in England and apparently in Boston, they were aware of the story of it, and it became an embarrassment to King Louis the Fifteenth because it was seen that he wasn't able to deal with it because uh, he even sent a company of dragoons, uh, of the army, he sent the army in, but they they just couldn't catch it. That they just couldn't. They, it was such a so wide... it was actually attacking. There was it, there was a real beast attacking people. Yes, so people assumed that it was a werewolf. Or some people thought it must have been a werewolf because of its size um, and its strength, how it could travel very, very fast and could jump over walls 10 feet high. Uh, so obviously with uh, werewolf mythology being very well established by that point, some people would have believed, yes, this is a werewolf. Some people might not have been so sure. They might have thought it was some sort of hybrid. Um, but that's the thing. It was the uncertainty of what it really was that caused the fear and the panic to escalate. What is it that could successfully evade a, a company of dragoons? You know, the, the, no matter how much they sort of threw at trying to solve the problem, they still couldn't catch this beast. And, and you know, so that, that, that fear and that panic that escalated. That's interesting. It, it's, little has changed. 
Mm. Oh, yes. You, you, I mean, we've got these cryptozoology sightings. Um, they were just talking about, you know, um, sort of dogmen sightings today that people, I don't know whether anything happens or anyone's attacked, but you mm. you get, I mean, yeah, yeah. you get yeah, the same different- thing to this day. Yeah, exactly. Sightings of all kinds of creatures. Yeah. Yeah. That is fascinating. I was just saying hi. We have Glastronaut, Jolly, Jonicide. Lee was in the room. Welcome, everybody. Make sure to ask your questions. We'll pop them up to Matthew or um, anyone who wants to ask. Now, we the, the moon, we've got the Beast of... Javadine. See, look, see, everyone has to remind me. <laughs> We've got these different beasts. Now, do you know anything about how, like, it has changed? Like, because the Christian idea and the morality, a lot of us, even though we're foundationally Christian, mm-hmm. we get all our stuff from the movies, but we've obviously borrowed it from the movies. But what what would you say, like, wolves serve today? Like in in popular culture, I mean, it's probably changed since Lon Chaney's time, but like like it, it, it's yeah. a warning. Is it is is it sort of a combination of the beast within, or what? Like yeah, that's interesting because um, we, obviously uh, in the same way that all of the different mythologies uh, sort of borrowed from each other. For example, Greek. I mean, Greek mythology. Um, every every different author told the story in a slightly different way. So that the, the the fundamentals of the story were well known across across all of ancient Greece. But as an author, to mark yourself out, it it was what you did with that story. It was the little details that you added, or the bits that you left out, and the different direction mm-hmm. that you took the story in. And we're still doing that now with the different films that we have, like the horror genre, different types mm-hmm. of werewolf films. I mean, Teen Wolf. They, I mean, that's a completely comedy. different type of werewolf. A comedy, yeah, about about yeah. growing up. And, and fitting in and so, it's, so yeah. everything every time a story is reinvented it's first, a wolf <laughs> as um, as raging hormones <laughs> yes exactly yes a different kind of well, piece with it perhaps <laughs> if we go back to long cheney's um juniors wolf you almost feel sorry for him he was almost cursed but he's like this really nice sort of guy but he kind of comes into connection with the gypsies there's like this merging of superstitious cultures with modern cultures and there's this fear i feel but he's almost like this sympathetic character where you feel really bad for him yes that's that's very interesting when you go beyond the obvious moral outrage of these these terrible killings and so on when when you see it as an affliction um, then it takes on a whole different story. Yeah, because it, obviously the easiest thing to do is, is to judge morally, which is what the the, per, the idea behind the accusations and the persecutions um, in the sort of Renaissance period. Um, now we, it's a lot more subtle because we, we're thinking, okay, what? how would it affect that one person? What would it be like to be that person, to then be transformed into that beast? How, how would they feel? They haven't necessarily done anything yet, but they have this affliction. So it's interesting to, to, to look at a different side of that mythology. And say what what made that what happened to that person that made them that way, and we're getting into yeah. the cause of things, and that's I think when things get really interesting when you look at what motivates people or what affects yeah. people. And he's got the perfect look for it, Lon Chaney Jr. He has that sympathetic big bear kind of look to him, where yeah, you're like the poor guy. Oh uh, yeah, yeah, it, it, that's, that's really interesting. It it, that's very clever when you can take uh, take a figure that has normally been feared. And, uh, you know, sort of, um, yeah, the, the thing to be feared suddenly is the thing that you feel sorry for, that you sympathize with. That's that's an achievement. If you can get a story that shifts our perceptions, that's that's quite a good thing to do. And they've done it with vampires, too. Yes, that's um, true. We've got another one here, um, another fairy tale that we're referencing. Ooh, are we are we looking at a werewolf in Beauty and the Beast, too? Yes, that's another one. Um, yeah, Beauty and the Beast, uh, uh, totally, uh, again, it's it sort of slightly, come, because it's aimed at children, it comes back to a more sort of morality tale about the idea of this um, this uh, sort of werewolf type character be, to being sort of outcast and shut away in that castle. And yeah, it, it's a totally different take on it. It's um, mm-hmm. it's like a, like a moral tale again for children. Yeah, because I mean, a lot of people think Disney, but the Beauty and the Beast goes way before Disney, because if you look at Cocteau, he has uh, his version, silent version, that's really amazing yep, of Beauty and the Beast. So it's it's not just about Disney. This tale goes way further than that. 
oh yeah disney uh, will we'll take all of these stories wherever they come from however old they are and reinvent them for the screen yeah beauty and the beast goes back to 1740 1740 guys um, beauty yeah, and the beast riding hood uh, 1697 and then the brothers grim sort of did their version of it as well so th these stories go way back way way back yeah. And they obviously hold water and then get passed on. And and I mean, it's easier. We, we I mean, we write things down. Mm. We, I've got people mentioning um, like Wendigo and th th there's probably a lot of wolves. I mean, there's wolves everywhere. The, the indigenous yes. cultures that are more orality that don't uh, necessarily have characters written down. Um, we yes. have things written down. So it, it gets handed down. I mean, it's going to mm -hmm. change like playing telephone, but there's going to be a, a consistency to it. Um, there's a whole lot of spookiness with with um, indigenous Wendigo beast characters that are to yes. be, and yeah. also the, the, the Navajo uh, people as well. They, they have the, the Skinwalkers, which is a similar thing with the, the shape shifting mythology. So it's interesting that you've got these different cultures all around the world that have got their own version of a, of a similar kind of thing. So that that tells us that there's something fundamental within us all that. Um, the, the idea of, of, of who we are, what influences us, what happens to people, what are the consequences of things, how would we react to these supernatural events, what would they mean to us? And it's yeah, the, the, there's so many stories. Um, if we listed them all here, we'd be you know we'd be going we'd be here a week. <laughs> there's there's so much <laughs> fascinating stuff to, to delve into. It's it's it, yeah, it's amazing. So what made if we go back to France, what makes the this time in France? In mm -hmm. French literature, what makes what made it stand out for you to write about this? Okay, so yeah, so for as me, as opposed to indigenous yeah. or Rome mm -hmm. or whatever. Okay, yeah. So one of the things that interested it, um, me in it was uh, old French and how it's kind of halfway between Latin and modern French and how it evolved. That 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 fascinates me. So um, it's a it's a great example of old French or Anglo Norman. Um, because it, it's still got quite a bit of Latin in it, but it's got a few sort of Germanic or Frankish words. So you can start to see the language evolving away from Latin, like vulgar Latin, into common Romance languages and so on. But also, the, 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 these stories, they must have been good because they were then translated into Old Norse. They were there, so they were they they hadn't they clearly had an appeal that was wider than the audience that spoke that language. They, they were sort of told and retold and then told in different languages. So, uh, they, yeah, they, they were translated into Old Norse and then became part of some of the sagas. Right. Oh, so I that, see. That was the, so so yeah, this... Exactly, a crossover between two completely different types of literature, but where they, they've taken it and translated it into Old Norse because it, it has uh, an appeal beyond its original intended audience. That's, I think that's right. Right. So yeah. they're, they're kind of borrowing... Yeah, exactly. And, yes. then they, and then and then translating yeah. it into their own language. Yeah, they're kind of a cross pollination, as it were. Yeah, exactly. Interesting. So, yeah. And and of course, like like we said, I'm I'm not sure if they had serial killers in Norse cultures, but you obviously see it by the time we get to the French culture with the Gilles Garnier and the different mm -hmm. types of thing. Um and it is a way to explain something we don't understand. I mean, even today I don't know how well we understand psychopathy. And mm -hmm. that kind of mentality, we're still afraid of it today. Yes. And it's also interesting because the, the word lycanthrope or lycanthropy um, originally described the idea of a wolf human. But lycanthropy is also described as a condition within the field of psychiatry where somebody genuinely believes that they are a werewolf or that they are they have an affliction as a werewolf or that they have the power to transform themselves into a werewolf. So then it also then becomes a, a, a psychiatric condition as well. And that's so that's an extra meaning that, that that word contains. You guys had in England, there was a modern case. I don't know if it was in the 80s or 70s. Oh, I can't remember the name. But you had a modern case of a fellow who uh, who thought he had lycanthropy. Oh, you know what? The name evades me. I just can't think of it. Oh, I can't think of it either. I, I've heard stories. I'll have to where... Google it. Yeah, I've heard stories of modern times as well of people thinking that they were vampires as well, and yeah, so it's it's amazing because obviously it's it's there's there's some sort of lure of appeal about these these stories. Oh, I think his name was John Webster. Aha, uh -huh, okay. If someone just texted that in. Someone's. I I just um I just googled it. Uh huh. 
Um, and John Webster's. No, maybe it wasn't. Maybe it wasn't John Webster. But mm. um, yeah, there. I seen him on a documentary, and that's why I'm mentioning it. And it was modern, yeah. like this. They had him, and they were interviewing him, and the police said that they seen him. They seen him doing strange, like he terrified the police and everything when they arrested him. He was oh. caught doing all sorts of things. So the, the stuff like this is still happening, where people are behaving wolfish. Yeah, yeah. Modern there's time. something about that 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 um, that people. Uh, almost w want to sort of allow themselves to become there's something attractive about the idea of, of transforming into the, into that beast or that animal or werewolf or vampire that it, it's um that it still fascinates people after after all this time was yeah i mean most of us obviously we, we very much enjoy the films and the literature but for some people to to then want to to emulate uh the subject of that literature that 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 is is sort of fascinating it makes you wonder sort of what it is about it that they have found so interesting or that they have felt influenced by. Oh, I so, do so think it might. It might. I think it might have been John John Webster, but right. um, that did that. But it's it's something where I'd be worth anybody who's interested to right. actually write about mod. Like people write about modern day fairy sightings. I have yep. someone coming on who identifies. And she doesn't think she's a vampire, but vampire culture. So it's interesting yes. to see people who. I mean, I mean, can look at it from a mental health perspective uh, or yes. whatever. Like people think that they're all sorts of things today. So I guess yes. why not a werewolf? And what's interesting is that the people that do, they might sort of manifest that in different ways. Um, I remember that there was a guy in Germany who, who had had some sort of surgery, some sort of dental surgery on his incisors so that they looked more like sort of a vampire's teeth. And there's there's a picture of him smiling as he was led away in court, having been sentenced to something, and he'd had these sort of teeth done. But for, but for some people, it might just be you know an interest in the literature, the the the, the mythology, the the nocturnalism, the idea of the night, of, of the moon. All the, you know, the, so everyone sort of everyone approaches it in different ways. There there are common things underneath that get us all interested, but within that, we all each and every one of us finds different things that fascinate us. Hopefully, in each story. And also the, uh, the the Icelandic sagas as well, the, the, the Norse, the old Norse, uh, all of the saga tradition, there are stories of, uh, again, people sort of putting on wolf skins and, and becoming sort of some yeah. sort of some sort of lycanthropic type character, like the, the Volsung saga. There, there, are, there are two, I think it's a father and son or brothers, that they, they come across a, 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 you know, these, these skins and they put them on and they become the sort of werewolf-like creatures. Yeah. So and I, f I find that interesting that we we've gone from that to where it's almost like wearing a fur coat, but you're yeah. actually psyching yourself up for battle. You go from yes. that to where you see modern days, and it's almost like a mental illness. Yeah, um, like Some people they're not putting themselves in cloak and trying to intimidate yeah. someone in battle. They they yeah. actually really believe it. It's become like a psychological yeah. state of mind. Yeah, there's some sort of fixation on it that goes way above and beyond what you might normally expect for someone interested in a certain type of literature or yeah, fascinated by one of those characters like a werewolf or a vampire. It's amazing. Yeah. Fasc clinically yeah. fascinating. It is. I mean, I mean, yeah, I, I can't even begin to understand why someone would want to see themselves as a wolf. Yeah. I, I mean, I, it's, it's beyond me, but well, we have someone else saying like you were talking about teen wolf as a teen, we yes. got someone talking about ginger snaps as a, really an allegory right. for women menstruation. And I know Absolutely. that might be an uncomfortable talk to, to, topic, but yeah, like it's, I mean, it's endless. We could go through all the, the yep. purposes that wolves <laughs> or werewolves serve. Um, yeah. And but, there are very takes on uh, Little Red Riding Hood as well, where it's the idea of, of going from being a girl into womanhood and watching out for the beasts, basically men. And uh -huh. that, that's a cautionary tale. And again, yeah, so that thing of growing up and becoming something else, shape shifting from a child into an adult. Right. Interesting. Yeah. Mm. So we have another question here. Show. We'll put it up there. Um, oh. Here we go. Uh, going back a bit, how many gods or goddesses had the heads of animals or werewolves? Is there like a goddess with a werewolf head? Okay. Um, let's see. In Egyptian mythology, 
I think there are somewhere, uh, um, I think it's about 25, 26 different gods that have a human form, but the head of another animal. So the, the idea of um, gods having this sort of shape-shifting ability uh, at least goes back to ancient Egyptian mythology. Uh, some of them, I think, are a bird or a, a falcon specifically, or a wolf or a jackal. There are a couple of cases of Egyptian gods having sort of a wolf head or a jackal's head. Um, yeah, definitely, some, certainly within Egyptian mythology, with, with the way that they're depicted as well. Interesting. Now, with when you, when you're translating mm -hmm. and you're doing a lot of this, because I don't know if any of you know this, if you go to Matthew's uh, website or you look him up on Amazon, he translates a lot of different languages. And through translating, you you must get a better sense of the culture. Like Absolutely. by being so close to that language. And and it's yeah. I just find it fascinating that you decided to focus on wolf werewolf tales instead of looking at some some other topic. I think of of all of the these the collection of these twelve poems by uh, Marie de France, it was that one that got me the most interested because it was about werewolves. It had that extra something that got me interested. I I, I if it hadn't been about werewolves, I would have just picked one at random and said, oh, let's have a look at that one. But because this one was about werewolves. That, that got my interest. That gave it an extra level of fascination for me. That's what it is. Did, did you always have that fascination, like with werewolves, or is it just because it's a supernatural nature? I think, yeah, the werewolves are, and supernatural stuff generally, pretty much all my life, and, and language is the same thing as well. So that, that perfectly combines two things that I was very interested in, and that got my, that got my attention, yeah. And also the, the, the way that, because when you translate something, first of all, there's the, the sort of the... The literalizing where it's literally word for word but then that tells you about the syntax of the language where they put words in the order of a sentence and it has a very different mm. feel to it um so the way they order a sentence in old norse is very different to old french so it tells mm. you a bit about how they put the words together that the priority of the meaning within a sentence and the balance of how that's laid out uh, it, it they have a completely different feel to them it's, it's fascinating Interesting. I wonder how that would compare to English now, modern. Yes. We're, we're, uh, I mean, we're a living language, so. Indeed, yes. And part of um, that was another thing as well, looking at uh, how a thousand years ago, the languages that we all spoke uh, here, over here in Europe were sort of closer, that they hadn't evolved as far away from each other as they have now, of course. Mm -hmm. So uh, the Romance languages, they're still to a degree mutually intelligible with degree of cooperation. But back in the time of uh, Bisclavery, um, the, the, it was it was less, well, there were different varieties. There was a kind of a dialect continuum, but they could all pretty much still basically understand each other. Um, but now, I mean, it's... Um, lots of languages have evolved much further away. So, for example, the dif difference uh, between English and Scandinavian languages was much closer because English was a West Germanic language and uh, Old Norse was like a North Germanic languages. So so they're, they're on the same family tree, but on slightly different branches. A thousand years ago, they would have been closer. And it's interesting. So looking at Old English, um, if, if you were to read an Old English text, if you could read the handwriting for a start, they, they wrote letters very mm -hmm. differently. But it, it's yes. sound, it's got much more of a Germanic feel to it, obviously because it's before 1066, before the before the Normans invaded the and the introduction of French into the development of English. It, the, the language has mm -hmm. a very different feel. Now, a lot of people couldn't write or read in those days. Is there is there outside of written language? Is there like um, visuals or stone carvings or anything like that of werewolves or tales? Like because a lot of people they wouldn't have been able to read. So yeah. how I, how are they keeping track? Like they wouldn't know. They would just it would be word of mouth and talking about these different experiences is my guess. Absolutely, and that is how the 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 sagas survived for many centuries before they were finally written down. Uh, through oral tradition, and there, I mean, there would have been some sort of uh, runic uh, stone carvings, but also uh, the way things would have been depicted. Sometimes there would have been uh, pictures or sort of allegories carved or um, uh, inscribed or sculpted out of something on a surface or, or drawn or painted. So you, you might have a, a description of a, a particular type of animal, let's say a werewolf. They might describe in different ways. 
um, but then they might be sort of depicted as well. So some, sometimes you do mm -hmm. get, think, think decorative items like sort of bronze plates and cups mm -hmm. and things that they found left over in um, sort of with, with wealthy sort of noble people within Scandinavian culture, it, within their graves, they would have found sort of precious items that would have very well carved with depictions of various things. And that tells us a lot about how they how they saw things, how they depicted them. And then obviously, yeah, right. word of word of mouth as well, oral tradition. So would the priests, because they were one of the main people who were writing back in history, yes. in medieval yes. times, they're obviously recording some of this stuff. Like, I wonder if you would find some of these stories in any of their records, like if they had records of this, because so, at some point someone's writing it down. I'm sure the printing press had something to do with, you know, oh, it yeah. being more dispersed. I mean, we can get Absolutely. into that, but someone's got to be, it can't, it has to be word of mouth, but at some point someone's writing it down by hand. Yes. That's and it would have been, I mean, a lot of times not even nobles could yep. read very well. I mean, we're not yep. just talking, we're talking like rich people didn't even really know how to read in some instances. Yeah, so it was, um, yeah, so it, were any sort of well-educated person, uh, I mean, obviously priests were educated to that standard where they could read and write, obviously, because they had to be, it was necessary. But also within the nobility, it would have been uh required to a degree to, to reach that standard of reading and writing. Um, but there were some people who did manage to become educated outside of that, and they would have had different interests. I mean, people that weren't priests obviously wouldn't necessarily have been interested in copying sort of ancient Christian texts or you know, copying out pages or verses from the Bible. They would have found other things, like, which is obviously why uh, so many texts have been transmitted and preserved in different forms thousands of mm -hmm. years after written. Uh, the whole uh, translation of Latin texts into Greek, but then the Western Roman Empire collapsed, but they were preserved in Greek. And then during the Islamic mm -hmm. Golden Age, they would have been translated into Arabic or Syriac, and then translated back into Greek or you know back into Latin and then back into English. So that they've all they've all been sort of passed around. Right. Mm. Just probably like the Bible was, and then you yep. get into the printing printing press, and then you have mass distribution. Absolutely, yeah. So uh, suddenly In. you could print pamphlets, and something could be very, very widely dispersed. Uh, like propaganda. The, 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 uh, propaganda. Wolf, where, werewolf propaganda. <laughs> exactly. they're, they're, they're werewolves. They're real. Watch out, everyone. Yeah, exactly. Propaganda value. Mm. Well, that's that's fascinating. So. Is there anything else, like, is there anything that you want to add about werewolves and maybe in modern time? Does anybody else have uh, any more questions? I'll tell you what I will, if I, I might just quickly say, I can't remember if I said this to you already or not, but um, there's a quote, I can't remember who said it, but they said, society is the suppression of our animal selves. And I think werewolf mythology definitely seems to support that idea. The beast within that we all suppress it's a very powerful metaphor, and uh, I think we, we we find it fascinating. That I think I wanted to just mention that quote. Yes, and I I think that's probably one of the best analysis of it is like, like the closest one we even still follow is that there is this suppressed. You could yeah, I'm sure Young would call it the shadow self, or some sort um, of things that are taboo that yeah. you try to hide, and it sort of. Mm, yeah. you know stays there and and you and it becomes a sort of mm. demonic wolf-like and uh, yeah. beastly thing yeah or, or keeping a secret that's eating away at you from the inside all these mm -hmm. sort of different metaphorical ideas of what it could be the beast or something bad within that we suppress mm. so anastasia says wasn't it the invention of the printing press that spread the world about werewolves oh definitely definitely, definitely absolutely yeah, yeah. It, like i say that the, the pamphlets that were distributed Suddenly, they would be available in, even in other countries. And in fact, that's the part of the reason why we know about Peter Stumpf, because uh, the, the only pamphlet that survived, 16 pages, it was translated into English the next year. None of the German copies survived, but we've still got the English translation. And that's how we know and, about it. And that's exactly why witch hunting became like they tried multiple times to go through yes. villages with witch hunting. It was the printing press, yep. as much as good as it was, these. People obviously used it to, they didn't have to go. They could just leave their stuff behind and it helped propagate, you know, a hysteria yeah. of witches. Yeah. And obviously the witch finder general, uh, Matthew Hopkins, 
he was able to publish his own book, Discovery of Witches, basically refuting the people who didn't agree with what he was doing to say that there's an answer to all my critics. I'm going to carry on going around and finding witches and, and you know, yeah. And I think, like, we can come right up to modern times cause, because that's what the internet is serving as right now for yes. people with, there's paranormal, there's a whole bunch of different stuff that people are saying that's real that may not be real. I mean, including Dogman, including Bigfoot, including a whole bunch of different things, but they have their own website. They can do whatever they want and spread yep. that message faster than they ever could before, including publishing their own books. So we've got the same thing happening right now, whether or not someone's seen it, I'm not going, you know, I don't know, but the same thing is happening on the, via the internet. Yeah, exactly. So it depends how we approach that information, how we filter it, uh, why we, what we hope to gain from that information and whether or not we sort of uh, check against other sources of information, check all your sources to see what matches and what doesn't. What is it that you're looking for and why? What do you hope to find? What do you deal with that information? Can you tell if something isn't right, if something's false? You know, how, mm -hmm. how do you check? How do you, so it's it's on us to sort of to filter through what's out there. There's so much information out there. It's incredible. Oh, yeah. And, and it's why, like, I, Cal, I want Cal to come on and we do a regular show because he does some of the best primary research. And a lot of people don't realize today on the Internet, this is not necessarily about werewolves, is that not everything's on the Internet. There's a lot yeah. of like and people are right click researching like you you have to there's archives there's newspapers there's things that's not on the internet it's called a primary source and a lot of people yeah. don't use primary sources they use some sort of crazy source on the internet yeah exactly or, yeah yeah, yeah. And i i think you it's know. interesting it's one of the things that cal says a lot is is what does the evidence say what does the evidence point to and he, you know look at all those different sources of evidence and see where it leads and that that's critical thinking yeah, you know, that, that's an important thing for us to keep hold of, to, to, to go out there and research yeah. all these different things and find them out there. And then there's also to realize that a lot of people will misinterpret, re-explain the oh. evidence, or they will cherry pick and use evidence that proves what they believe anyways. They don't say, I don't know, what does the evidence say? They have a theory, they have a thing, they know they've seen something, and then yeah. they just gather stuff and say, see, here it is. And they do that whether it's about coronavirus, whether it's yeah. about anything that, you know, and that's what's happening on the internet, I find, is they're not being objective like that, and they're not doing primary sources, and they're not letting the evidence lead, they're collecting what they want. Exactly. The quality control isn't necessarily there because it might serve an agenda. And uh, it's, it's yeah, which which facts do you pick to support your own theories as well? That's the other yeah. thing, rather than looking at everything and seeing what comes up. Exactly. And then yeah. getting other people to weigh in on it with you, people who are going to be critical of what you're saying, who are going to say, yeah. hey, you've missed this, you've missed this. That's important. Mm, absolutely, yeah. This is part of the scientific method. Read, read the paper, see, you know, see if you can find something we've missed. That's the, that's the way to do it, yeah. One last question from Anastasia. Why do we associate werewolf, wolf howl, with being scared, freaked out? I'm thinking Halloween. Brilliant like, you question. know that, the full moon, aroo! <laughs> <laughs> exactly, yeah. I think part of, the, part of the fear of that is not knowing which of the two it is, whether it is just a dog or a wolf, or if it is really a werewolf, and then not knowing which, which, which of the two it is, or does that mean that there is a werewolf nearby? Am I about to be attacked that it, it gets into something primal within us. Again, the, be and, the so, yeah, beast within. It's, I was going to say, it's got this lonely, solo, like wolves yes. can be very secretive and they can be yes. very hidden. And when you hear that howl, it just echoes. It's creepy. <laughs> yeah, the, the, the phrase lone wolf as well. When you hear a, a one wolf howl, you, you sort of wonder, you know, why that wolf is on its own. Obviously, normally, sometimes they're in packs. Why is it on its own? Is it out hunting or, you know... It, it's it's a very it's an incredible sound. It's hypnotic and beautiful and mesmerizing. I think. Yeah. And mm. uh, we must not forget. We have to mention Wolfman Jack on this show. Uh -huh. Do you know who Wolfman Jack is? Uh, I'm afraid you're going to have to enlighten me on that one. Okay, okay, okay. You can look him up. He was a radio DJ. Uh, oh, in the, was it in the 1970s? Should, in the 70s, 80s, 60s, he was big. He had his own. He did radio, and you can look him yeah. up in his story, but he has this unique, like, hey, 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 it's the Wolfman Jack. And he yes, was, I have heard of him. Yes, I, What I a have. character. And he looks like a wolf. People can actually look wolfish, and he used that to his advantage, and people loved him. 
Oh, that's another thing that reminds me, actually, because there, there is something separate from the condition of lycanthropy, which is called werewolf syndrome, but its technical name, hypertrichosis, the, the, the rapid sort of growth of hair all over the body, and including the face and, and everywhere else, that, that, that can make someone look like a depiction of a werewolf. The hypertrichosis, yeah, werewolf syndrome is, is different. You've seen that. There's like a, a royal, like families or elite people. There's paintings of mm. people who look, who were all really hairy. Yeah. Oh, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And they, they were sort of taken to the sort of circuses and, and you know, freak shows and that kind of thing to, to be displayed to the public out of fascination. Oh, uh, uh, is it American Graffiti, the film that had Wolfman Jack in it? Yeah, it po possibly <laughs> did. Yeah, he was also he was also in this other horror. Movie, I can't remember, but he's been in multiple different movies where they've used yeah. his voice. To yeah. um, it was there was a horror movie, and I can't remember what it was called. I um, I just watched it like a month or two months ago, and yeah. it was from the eighties. And you, you, they're driving around, and you hear his voice on the radio, so they insert him in there. Ah, oh, brilliant! Yeah, yeah, I have heard of him. Yeah. yeah, there you go. Um, someone says I think Matthew is sporting that tonight. They're saying. Oh. <laughs> thank you very much thank you <laughs> he's good all right well if let me know if you have any last questions we're gonna sign out in a little bit um like matthew was uh was saying do you want to show everybody your book and tell them where to get it before we sign out okay so here it is bisclavre uh medieval uh werewolf tale by marie de france which i've translated from the original french and you can find it on Amazon and other bookstores, and it can be ordered from anywhere. So if you Google it, it should come up, uh, my name as well. Thank you very much. Okay, and just so you guys know, I'm going to put uh, Matthew's website here. It is matthewleambleton.co.uk. You can check it out and check him out on Amazon. And also, don't forget to subscribe on YouTube or whatever platform you guys are watching at on the podcast. Because, like I said, Cal and I are going to be doing something. Things are going to change. But all of October, I do have the Halloween guests on. I believe I've got Steve Stockton coming next week. And we'll be talking vampires. Appalachian vampire folklore. I have a film director, Damon Blalack, coming on the 20th. We're talking all about Bram Stoker's Dracula. He's um, worked in film and is a big fan. I also have uh, Anne Celine coming on on, I believe it is the... 13th uh, i'll get that up uh, 15th i think it is and she's talking all about vampire culture and then 23rd i have anthony um coming on and he's talking about demonology and demon possession maybe and hey we never even got into that about deeply about like demon possession today and vampires and whatnot and the catholic church and god who knows there could be like wolf exorcisms out there and demonology by king james a fantastic text king james oh. of england and scotland yeah he wrote a book called demonology i think it was 1597 or something like that yeah fascinating did he really mm. and he was obviously very afraid of witches oh very much so obviously yeah hence the interest in uh, macbeth and shakespeare and that, all that yeah interesting well i want to thank you for coming on and thank talking about that fascinating really topic it. Thank you. Right. Everybody go and get Matthew's book. It is great. And he's got a whole bunch of other books there. Um, like he's got books on runes and a whole bunch of different books in the similar vein about uh, translation and language and uh, Norse and Celtic stuff. So check him out on Amazon. <laughs> We're going to end the stream, guys. Take care and we'll talk to you next week. We're going to be here next week. <laughs> Thank you.